Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 514 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 1st of November 2020 as I record this. So today I'm talking to Wendy Jones who is Scottish so you will love listening to her accent. Wendy is also one of the most dynamic and energetic people I know as well as a consistently positive voice in the author scene which we all need. (laughs) She was in the Royal Navy and the Army and talks about how she got into writing and blogging and we are in November now so it's encouraging to know that she started with fiction during NaNoWriMo in 2012 and I also started that way in 2000. Uh, If you don't know, nanowimo.org is National Novel Writing Month and it's in November, which is right now if you're listening at that time. (laughs) So if you want to join, it's still, you can join any time, obviously, in November. And maybe this is the month to get into that fiction you've always wanted to write. So Wendy also talks about her hybrid publishing career, how she manages to juggle writing books for children, like Bertie the Buffalo, which even has its own cute plush toy, with indie fiction and non-fiction, the pros and cons of working with a publisher, as well as how she markets all the books differently, plus when you might need a new edition of a non-fiction book, which is something I'm always considering. So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, the hot sheet reports some interesting things from the digital Frankfurt Book Fair this year. Michael Tamlin, CEO of Kobo, said that they've compressed three years of digital sales growth into six months. People who started purchasing ebooks during lockdown are continuing to purchase as any other customer would. Kobo is enjoying its best ebook sales year ever, as well as record e reader sales. So that is great news. Also, the discussion of streaming continues. The CEO of Storytel said at Frankfurt that, quote, streaming activity is not cannibalizing the market, but growing it. And 50% of Sweden's fiction sales are in audio format, primarily served through subscription services. The other half are print. Ebooks comprise a small percentage of overall sales and are rarely discussed. Now, I've mentioned this before, and this idea of print then straight to audio. And we get so used to thinking that it goes print, ebook, audio, but that's because in the bigger markets of the US, UK, Australia, Canada, bigger English speaking markets, that's how it's gone for us. But as I've said, I think a lot of markets will probably just skip (laughs) ebooks and go straight to audio. So this is fascinating. This kind of leapfrog technology, I've talked about it before with Africa is a great example of people leaping. They don't go desktop, laptop, mobile. They're going desktop or nothing straight to mobile. So most of the digital economy in the continent of Africa, for example, is mobile. And the same in a lot of Asia. So this is just, it's so interesting to think how differently things happen in different parts of the world. And making sure that if your mindset is global, as mine is, that we can take advantage of these different markets and make sure our work is available in these different ways. So coming back to Frankfurt, uh, the CEO of Storytel said that the the traditional publishers have been resistant of this. And even Sweden-based Bonnier, who pulled its books from Storytel some years ago, eventually returned when it saw its print sales decline after being absent from the service. Because, as I've mentioned, audio is a great way to discover things and you will end up buying books in other formats. So I definitely, as I've talked about, audio drives sales for me in terms of print and ebooks. If I discover uh, an author or a book or I may if I buy it in audiobook I may well also buy it in other formats also talking about this and I haven't mentioned this before because I've been waiting to see how it played out but clearly now this is happening uh, a number of authors are reporting that audible is actively encouraging returns of audiobooks so listeners can get another one for their credit and this has been going around in the author 
various groups on Facebook. And this is bad for authors as you don't get paid for a book that's been returned. And I think that the emphasis on this is on, and obviously we're not saying you shouldn't return an audiobook. You should return an audiobook if it is not your thing or if it's bad. But this is also returning audiobooks that you have listened to and enjoyed. You just want your credit back. And this is, I think, the reason they're doing this. And this is all my opinion. This is not news. This is my opinion. (laughs) Do not quote me in any official sources. But I think this is about the unlimited streaming options that are now available on other platforms. Storytel, for example, Scribd and uh, library services, for example. There are lots of streaming and subscription and these micro payment models where people are uh, getting more audio for their money. And I think this is because Spotify is likely entering the space in 2021. Now, I understand that many authors are resistant to the streaming and subscription models. But I hope that you can see it is much better to get a micro payment than it is to get nothing. So I would expect that the audible contracts are going to be changing and that we will see a big shake up in 2021. This is a very clear direction of the industry. And from my personal opinion, as I've always said, I don't have any problem with subscription. I just have a problem with exclusivity. KU and the Audible exclusivity is the issue to me, not the fact that it's subscription and or streaming. So Storytel also said authors are very happy and surprised at how well the streaming services are working. Suddenly, they're not just selling the book they wrote one year ago, they're selling the book they wrote 10 years ago. Norway's authors are demanding to be on more unlimited subscription platforms. So I hope that's encouraging to you if you have some resistance to it. And if you are resistant, I was thinking about this idea of resistance to the march of technology. And I understand that we all have reasons why we have problems with things. Some people have said that I have too much of a problem with KU. My mum's books are on KU because she won't do any form of marketing at all and it's just the easiest. So my mum, as Penny Appleton, writes Sweet Romance and so her books are in KU because she's not going to do anything else. So I understand that it's good for some people but I think you have to understand why you're resistant to things. So if you're feeling like, oh, I think unlimited is really bad and unlimited subscription is really bad, you have to decide why that is. And I think this streaming model for audio and this unlimited subscription is the is a dominant change in consumer behaviour that is only going to become more prevalent. So... Many of us have been, in quotation marks, forward thinking by being digital first, and it's certainly proven its worth during this pandemic year, and thinking global. And the mo- the world moves very fast. And in fact, the movement of digital change has happened faster this year than ever, as Michael Tamblin mentioned there. Streaming and subscription models are mainstream and growing fast. If you're feeling resistance to this, then consider why and then think, okay, if this is the way things are going, how do I make sure I don't miss the the next wave of consumer behaviour? And that's what you know we have to think about. Consumers, readers, listeners are the people who put money in our pockets. <laughs> so we have to see how this works. Okay, so also other things. I mentioned the session on podcasting last week at Frankfurt and how podcasting helps with sales. But very interesting, and I've seen a jump in advertising requests for this show. It's like the publishing industry have just suddenly gone, oh, look, we should be paying for advertising on podcasts. But it's the hot sheet notes that, and this quote, I think, is prescient. This is going to be a thing. (laughs) In the future, book contracts may ask the author for podcast rights. Now, I think probably publishers are picking that up. And if you're getting a contract with a publisher after Frankfurt 2020, it may already be there. And in fact, if you look at your contract around audio, it may be that it's not the wording is not even for audiobooks. It might be audiobooks, podcasting, or just audio in general. But to me, a podcast is not just a an audiobook put out in chapter format can be, but I think audio fiction can be quite different. There's a quote from 
Alice Lloyd at Trapeze Books, which is part of Orion Publishing, said publishers ideally know from the point of acquisition if they want to produce a podcast to help build the author's platform or tie into the book, maybe a standalone series or a continuing show. I think this is fascinating and I do think that we need to watch out for this and if you are going to sign a contract, consider what that maybe have an idea about what that podcast might look like and also what you want the money to be around that because podcasts can be amazing or they can be nothing at all (laughs) so I just this is so fascinating to me I did not expect to see that because in my mind podcasting is a marketing format but as I said there's starting to become some huge money in podcasting and it can also be its own material. It can be its own story. It can be not just a companion piece, but even turning a book into a podcast or turning a podcast into a book is becoming uh, even more common. So anyway, if you're interested in keeping up with industry news, particularly focused on the sort of bigger picture things and traditional publishing contracts, etc., check out The Hot Sheet at hotsheetpub.com. And thanks to Jane Friedman, who continues to produce that, which is fantastic. In other publishing news, I finally got access to the new Amazon Author Central, which is at author.amazon.com. And this is a upgrade from the old Author Central. It's uh, much, well, if you do have access, it's not available to everyone. Some people have said, oh, I've had it for years. I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) So I'm, uh, maybe they're just rolling it out in the UK now. But I know lots of people still haven't got it. But it's worth going to author.amazon.com to see if you do have a profile, if you've already set up your Amazon Author Central before. You can now manage your author profile in multiple languages in one place, which is really useful. You can see your sales rank per book, per market. You can see reviews in a much easier format and generally lots of better info. So I only found that because I logged into Amazon Author Central to claim a book and it gave me a link to click. So yeah, have a look at that. Looks like they're rolling it out worldwide. Also, last week I mentioned Google Play's new promo codes, but they also, I thought I'd mentioned it, but Some people said I didn't. So Google Play has increased their royalties to 70%. You do need to go in and accept the new terms of service. So go do that. But yeah, that's pretty exciting in that now that is on a par with the other services. In useful stuff, I wanted to mention Tim Ferriss's interview with Yuval Noah Harari, whose books Sapiens and Homodeus are on my list of the best books of the last decade <laughs> in terms of making you think uh, bigger picture and longer term. And they talk in the interview about a number of things that are interesting for authors. How Sapiens was originally self-published, I did not know this, as a set of notes from Yuval's lectures. And then they spent four years editing it. They redid the translation which is fascinating. So the first translation into English was not great. They eventually, his husband helped get an agent and they made it into what has been a massive bestseller. So I love the story because many people see something like Sapiens and they think, oh, wow, traditional publishers saw this gem in the rough and then, you know, turned, it became an instant success. That's not true at all. It really had a sort of four year process from original publication through to making it to the bestseller list. It's also being turned into a set of graphic novel books or graphic nonfiction, I guess it is. And they talk about the process of adaptation, which is also really interesting. It's something I'm fascinated with. It's also another format, if you think about it, I own I own Sapiens and Homodeus in multiple formats and I am very likely to buy. In fact, I, I think I've already put it on my list uh, of uh, books to buy this graphic novel version. There's going to be four of them and I think this is really interesting. Uh, they also talk about time managing time to focus what's on what's important fiction as philosophy and this is uh, important this week why politicians are never the people with any insight into the human condition (laughs) it's really interesting why suffering is more important than pleasure and something I can't stop thinking about is just a throwaway line that Yuval said he said if you have come to terms with your own mortality then you should be able to come to terms with the potential extinction of your species and that just made me go whoa that is a huge statement and it's just in this discussion of this is what I mean about bigger picture and about thinking bigger and I know (laughs) things are happening this week in the world and 
sometimes thinking long term can really help because we are just a little flash of light uh, in the vast arc of history. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sensitive to this right now as Tree of Life, my arcane thriller. My next book is goes into a lot about this and um, I do recommend reading Nova Scene by James Lovelock if that's something you're interested in too. So go and check out the interview on the Tim Ferriss podcast and there's one coming, there's also one with Seth Godin which I've just started listening to and Seth has a new book out this week, The Practice, which definitely will be relevant to us so that's on my pre-order list. I'll probably talk about that next week because I'll be reading it this week. So also in my personal update, I've been in really hardcore depth of editing. That detailed line edit, I did the whole book again. I made the changes from my, some suggestions from my editor and my wonderful beta reader. And I made some changes, but then I had to reread, I printed out and reread the whole book and did line edits again. And (laughs) I'm definitely at that point where I never want to see this book again. (laughs) When the creative cycle turns, I'm at that point in the creative cycle. Uh, I felt like it's a, it's a, I'm happy with the book. I am just, it was really hard work this week. I probably spent six hours a day in edits because I needed to get it finished by Friday afternoon. <laughs> so I was like, oh my goodness, I worked so hard. I had such, I, every night I, had a glass of wine and then collapsed because it was such hard work. Detailed line edits are possibly the hardest work, I think. It's all hard work, (laughs) but it was particularly hard work this week. I really felt it was. I also, this week, mentioning my mum again, Penny Appleton. And my mum, I did help her with the first uh, couple of books when she, helping her write them. But now she writes them herself and uh, I'm, I publish them for her. Because let's face it, she's 73 and not interested in any of that side of it. <laughs> but her latest book, which is a Summerfield Christmas Wedding. Yes, a Christmas wedding book. It is a senior, second chance, sweet romance, contemporary. I think there might be one kiss in it, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in it is in KU so a Summerfield Christmas wedding it's also in paperback and large print and we do pretty well with large print senior romance so if you love to escape into a holiday book or someone who might enjoy a senior romance check out a Summerfield Christmas wedding by Penny Appleton and I also just wanted to comment given the week we're about to have as this goes out it's going to be a week it's going to be one of those weeks <laughs> because, you know, I just want to mention kind of mental health and happiness right now. And this is the week of the US elections. We're not going to talk about politics, but this is also the week we're going back into lockdown here in England. They announced that last night. And of course, most of the UK is already in lockdown. Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland have already been in and several places in England are already in lockdown and lots of people are also in lockdown in Europe and other countries in the world and the winter is closing in and we've had this big storm and I'm very blessed in that I am a naturally happy, upbeat, positive person. That's my natural setting in my personality and I'm usually super positive and happy about life (laughs) and I'm giggling right now because even I have had some dark days this week. I've been like, oh my goodness, I... I don't want to go back into lockdown again. I'm careful like everyone nowadays. And I was thinking as we walked along the canal yesterday and the leaves are falling from the trees. On some, we had this big storm and some trees, they're they're completely bare now. The leaves have all gone. And the trees, realistically, at this time of year, they look like they're dying. The the trees look dead. They're they're bare and stretching up into this grey sky. And I was like, oh, goodness, it's all quite dark. But what I know, because I walk the canal a lot in across the entire year, is that the world will turn and spring will come again and these little buds will appear on the trees and the birds will sing and the squirrels will come out and the swans, there'll be new swans and new, new signets and the world will keep turning. And that's always good to think <laughs> when things are not going in the way we would like. So I just wanted to say that if you are struggling this week if you are doom scrolling let's face it who isn't doom scrolling at the moment try and avoid the news as much as possible if if, if you check the news once a day you're gonna you are gonna get the updates but maybe try and get out in nature take some long deep breaths (laughs) 
<laughs> try to avoid social media and rage and all the things that are bound to happen, however things go this week. And yeah, get outside and try and keep some perspective on the long arc of history. As I mentioned before, I, I can't give any advice on this except that I just wanted to acknowledge that this is a difficult time. And yeah, stay safe and stay sane this week. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. K9 Hannibal said about Tim's interview, This was great. The information is useful for all genres, not just horror. I totally agree. Imogen Clark said, listening to the podcast and wondering if I might have an inner dark side lying in wait as yet undiscovered. Uh, I think we all do, Imogen. (laughs) Karen Flieger or Flieger said, uh, I enjoyed today's interview with Tim Wagner, especially the part with a comparison of Jason to the Grim Reaper and Freddy Krueger to Satan. And thanks to Katerina Meyer, who sent a lovely picture from Berg, a small Austrian village about an hour east of Vienna. It had lovely fields and trees turning russet red. Thanks to Joshua also, who said, I've been listening to your podcast for the past few months and it's been helpful in so many ways. Yours is the only podcast that I don't skip the commercials. I keep being surprised at how useful they are. (laughs) Thank you, Joshua. And I think this is because I really only work with companies that I use and recommend. And I'm turning down a lot of potential sponsors at the moment because I want the commercials to be useful for you. (laughs) It's really important to me. So thank you if you listen to my ads and you buy things through my links because that helps. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen with a double N or you can leave a comment on the show notes or email me joanna at the creative pen.com or leave a comment on youtube if you're listening on youtube let me know what you think and send me a picture of where you're listening in from so today's show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons As time goes by and I head towards year 12 of the podcast can you believe it I have moments where I think I've said enough, but over and over again, you guys let me know that you want me to keep podcasting and that keeps me going. Patreon is not just about the income for me, it's also about the community. I answer patron questions every month on the bonus audio and also respond to urgent emails if people can't wait for the next Q&A. I have more of a relationship to my patrons and that means a lot emotionally. And of course, the money is much appreciated. You can support the show on Patreon for just a couple of pounds or dollars or euros a month and get the backlist Q&A, Q&A episodes where I giggle away and answer things to the best of my ability. You also get 10% off my courses at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Katerina Meyer, Stephanie Gunn, Maria Stahl and Casey McCormick. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, especially those people who've been supporting the show for years. And thanks to everyone continuing or increasing their pledge at this time. Just go along to patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Let's get into the interview. Wendy H. Jones is the award-winning and best-selling author of police procedural novels, as well as inspirational non-fiction, children's books, and useful books for authors. Her latest book is Marketing Matters, Sell More Books, which is something we all want to do. So welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, it's exciting to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. I got into writing, this sounds awful, it sounds a bit by accident, but it wasn't by accident. I've always been a writer, I've always been a reader. I've read since I was three, I've read mysteries, I've read all sorts of things, but I got into writing, first of all, I did academic textbooks and things when I was in the army, because I was in both the Royal Navy and the army, and I wrote textbooks because I was working in, in the School of Nursing, and you were expected to publish. Then I left the services and went into academia, and I'm very good at blagging, and I managed to blag my way into the head of education <laughs> studies. So I was writing uh, study skills books as well. And um, then I became ill. I got very ill with uh, my lungs, which are fine now, so nobody needs to feel sorry for me. But I was registered disabled, but I could still write because I could, if I stood up, my oxygen levels dropped. If I didn't stand up, I was absolutely fine. I had good oxygen levels. And you sit down to write. So I'd always written all through my career, all through my career. I'd written about where I was, what I was doing. 
And I'd always wanted to write a novel. So I decided to do NaNoWriMo, uh, which is National Novel Writers Month. I'm sure listeners to your uh, podcast know what that is. And I did, did 50,000 words of a novel. And I thought, oh, I might as well finish it. And then I got it edited and everything. And the rest, they say, is history. So that was how I got into writing. What year did you do NaNoWriMo? I did it in 2012. Oh, okay. Fantastic. So most of your books you have out now were written since 2012. They are, yes. And the first one was published in 2014. So it's not even six years yet. Wow. Well, you're doing brilliantly then. <laughs> <laughs> you are a hybrid author, I think, with traditional publishing as, as well. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm very fortunate. I've got the best of both worlds, as they say. <laughs> so I wondered, what are some of your comparisons between your publishing experiences and any lessons learned or thoughts for people? In terms of traditional publishing, I went, I tried to go down that route to start with, but I'm Scottish and we're not famed for our patience, I have to say, up in Scotland, especially in Dundee. So when you start to get rejections, I've been listening to your podcast, in all fairness, I've been listening to your podcast since I first started writing. And I knew about the indie author route and I thought I might as well give it a go and see how it goes. Fortunately, it went extremely well, but I did it all professionally because I had been listening to your podcast and other podcasts and listening to other people and following what they did, the Alliance of Independent Authors. I got a professional cover designer, a professional professional editor. I did it all correctly and it all worked out. But I've got a lot of confidence, so I'm able to do that. In terms of my traditional traditional route, I, I was asked to submit my young adult books to a publisher. So I didn't go down the route of being rejected. And what happened was, four days after I first pitched the first book, I got a three-book series deal with a publisher, which is unusual, because usually what happens with independent publishing is it takes years before you actually get anybody to take your first book and publish it, and it's an exercise in patience. Um, My children's book, again, I pitched publishers, and the second one picked it up. There is a difference, because to be honest, I didn't want to go down the um, independent route with my children's books, because I don't know enough about writing children's books to be able to do that. It wasn't something I'd ever thought I would do. Now, there are differences because in the um, going down the independent route, you're controlling everything. You're controlling what editor you're using. You're controlling what you're doing in terms of uh, the cover design. When it comes to publishers, you get no input to any of that. And the editing is done and they tell you what to do. And I'm going to give you a little example. There's an apocryphal tale that if your publisher says you have to put a a pink unicorn in your book, if you've signed a contract, you need to put a pink unicorn in your book, even if it's a crime book. And I thought that was apocryphal until my Bertie the Buffalo picture book, I was asked to put in an alpaca. And I went, there's no alpaca in the story. And they went, no, we want an alpaca. I said, do you mind if I ask why? And they said, because we like alpaca. (laughs) Okay. So I put an alpaca in. Now, they're lovely publishers, so please don't think that the publishers were forcing me into anything because they weren't. And to be honest, it's made the book better because Ari the alpaca is a great character. But once you've signed a contract, you can't say on the whole, I don't want to do that because the publisher will say, okay, we just won't go down the publishing route. Saying that, I've been fortunate in that both my publishers, if they've said, look, we really don't think this suits the book, I've been able to say why I think it does and they've kept it. It's a two-way process, but it's how you approach it. I've heard friends who say that their publishers have said, no, you're not doing that, you've got to do this and there's no other way we're doing it. And they've not been happy with um, what's been going on. So you're in control with one of them. You're not so much in control with the others. But if you're fortunate, you've got a two-way process where you can talk. No, I think that's really interesting because obviously you have books that you can control, your crime novels, your police procedurals and your nonfiction. You're controlling those yourself. So I guess you've got a bit of an outlet for your independent personality. And as you said, you're confident. I think of you as a very strong person. I wouldn't want to argue with you over your book. (laughs) I'd be like, anything you want, Wendy. 
<laughs> but let's um I want to talk about Bertie the Buffalo for a minute because I I was quite surprised when you did that book because I just didn't think of you as someone who wrote children's books. I know you said you had YA, but that seemed to come out of nowhere. And then what has happened with that book? Because you, you've got merchandise, you've got a cuddly toy for of Bertie. So tell us a bit more about how that book happens and some of the interesting things that have happened because of that. I've got this terrible habit of saying yes to everything and then worrying about the um, aesthetics of it later. And what happened was, it was a couple of years ago, I was on, I was working hard and I had Facebook open in the background because I was waiting for someone to get back to me on something through Messenger. And suddenly it pinged saying that I'd been tagged and somebody had tagged me and they said, oh, Wendy Jones will do it. And I'm like, what am I being volunteered to do? And it turned out it was a buffalo farm and I went, what do I know about buffalo farms and what are they volunteering me to do? It turned out that in real life, there was a baby buffalo running around the Scottish countryside on his own. He'd run away and nobody could find him. This was really happening. And people all over the world were saying, has he been found yet? Has he been found yet? The BBC had got involved. They'd called him Bert. Everybody was looking for Bert the buffalo. Somebody had said, Wendy Jones will do it, write a picture book. Because they were saying, you need a picture book, you need a picture book. So I said, yes, all right, then, and carried on with my life, finished what my editing of my book, brought it out because it was about to be published. That wasn't a children's picture book, it was an adult crime book. Anyway, in January, I got a message from the Buffalo Farm saying, out of all the people that have volunteered, we think you're the most professional. We'd like you to write this picture book for us. And I thought, I don't remember volunteering for anything, but okay. So I went and had a meeting with them and I said, as long as I can get a publisher, I'm happy to do it. So I got a publisher and it was a straight story. Then they said to me, we want it, which came as a complete surprise to me for two reasons. One, I didn't think you did things in rhyme because they're too difficult to translate. And secondly, I'm not a poet in the slightest. Anyway, they gave me a very short deadline as to when this needed to be in, done in rhyme by, which is probably a good thing because I'm very good at working to deadlines, very good, and it kicks my brain in. So suddenly, overnight, I came up with an entire rhyming version of Bertie the Buffalo, and the publishers loved it. And I signed a contract. Then everybody was saying, oh, we need a soft toy, we need a coloring book, and everybody was saying it. So I said to the publishers, I'd love a soft toy and a coloring book. And they went, oh, we don't think we want to go down the merchandise route. And then about eight weeks later, this little buffalo appeared on Facebook and they said, how about this one, Wendy? I was like, oh, my goodness, there was a soft toy. And it took a while longer for the soft toy to come. But Bertie is so popular. Everybody loves Bertie. He's an international success. And I've been all over the world with Bertie. I've done book tours with him. And there's going to be another book out, which is Bertie Goes to the Worldwide Games, roughly translated as to Bertie the Buffalo Goes to the Olympics. Mm. But we're not allowed to say Bertie Goes to the Olympics because you have to sponsor them. And apparently slipping them 20 quid in a brown envelope doesn't (laughs) count as sponsoring them. (laughs) Wow, I just love this story. But what so what is really interesting, right, is we talk a lot about branding and we're going to come to your marketing book soon. But branding of an author is important. And you've got all these different things going on. I think children's like Bertie the Buffalo is so different to your police procedural that this is crazy. So how how do you see yourself dealing with all these different genres now? Because you said you've got YA, you've got nonfiction, you've got the crime, you've got Bertie. Like, how are you managing all these different aspects of one author brand? Precisely. I'm all over the place. And it's difficult. I talk about branding in my book, but one of the things that I say is that book signings and things, and I say everywhere on the internet, is that I can literally cover you from the cradle to the grave. So any book you want from the cradle to the grave, I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, that's a, that's a good angle um, to, to come from. And I guess some people who might buy Bertie might also go, oh, well, actually, I, I don't want, I'll read Bertie to my grandkids or whatever, but I'll buy your police procedurals. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. I think that's why I also think it's important. What you did there is uh, you stepped through an open door and there's a time when saying yes to everything is a good thing. But I I sometimes feel as well that we say yes to, to too many things. Like I've definitely felt like I've said to, yes to too much, certainly during lockdown, in terms of 
how many online events I'm doing and all of that. So do you ever feel like you need to stop saying yes? Yeah, I do actually. To be honest, I'm when it comes to writing series, on the whole, I'm fairly amenable to most things. Yeah. I'm writing a narrative nonfiction now, which is about it's about the life of a chap called Thomas Graham. But it's going to be in a fiction book, but talking about a real life chap. And I was asked to take that on. And I did think very carefully about it before I agreed to it. I didn't just immediately say yes, but it's something I actually feel quite um proud of because he links to me in some ways my our paths have crossed in a lot of ways he was a doctor and he went to he joined the royal navy and he came from a, a working class background which i did but he became an officer in the royal navy i became an officer in the army and he found a cure for cholera so there's a lot of things where i but i did think very carefully there are other things that people have asked me to do and i have said no to them now because like you time is precious and if COVID has taught us anything. It's taught us that really time is precious. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that, you know, you and I um, have met in person quite a lot, but uh, I came up and spoke at one of your events that you were organising in in Scotland. And you're pretty embedded in the literary scene in Scotland, which I think is a, a, a very vibrant community. And I wondered, like, how do you feel that the impression of independent authors has changed in that Scottish literary scene? Because I feel it is still quite, it's got, it's funny, I feel like there's two parts. There's a sort of very literary, there's also a high highly literary Scottish angle as well as Celtic side and different language and yeah. very interesting. So, so how do this, how do Scots see independent authors? To be honest, I can't say I've ever been treated any differently to anybody else. Yes, I've never spoken at the um, Edinburgh Literature Festival, but neither have a lot of other people, regardless of how they're published, because it's an international festival and they're focusing on the international aspect. Although that may not happen in the future, given the fact that we're all in the middle of a pandemic. But we're never treated differently. I've never been treated differently. I'm a member of the Live Literature Database for the Scottish Book Trust. I've always been paid through the Live Literature Database. We are very fortunate that we've got a First Minister who is absolutely passionate about reading. And she puts money into this. We get There's money put into the literary, the literary scene in Scotland. And to be honest, I speak at festivals. Nobody's ever said to me, no, you can't speak at a festival. I might have not been able to speak because they're already oversubscribed. They've got too many authors. But nobody's ever said it's because I'm independently published and I'm seen the same as anyone else. I was asked to be the um, president of the Scottish Association of Writers. At that point, I didn't have a publisher. It's nobody treats you any differently. I'm on the committee of the Society of Authors in Scotland and the Society of Authors sees independent publishing and and traditional publishing as being equally valid routes into publishing. So nobody's treated any differently. No, that's really good. And I certainly, when I came up to that event, I did feel like it was very egalitarian and that there's lots of interesting things going on. So I really appreciate that. So let's get into your latest book for authors, Marketing Matters, Sell More Books, which is a recently updated edition, which is hilarious because I have How to Market a Book and I keep looking at it going, oh, I need to update it. But I still feel like, oh, 90% of it's valid. I really can't be bothered right now. But so I wondered what, why you decided to do a new edition and what has changed in terms of book marketing over the last few years? A lot has changed. First of all, the first book, I was, I've changed, and I need to say that because when I was asked to do the first book, I was asked to do a, a talk, a presentation on marketing because apparently I'm very good at it. That's probably because I listen to your podcast, Joanna. <laughs> so, you know, I've had lots of advice. <laughs> But I have had marketing training in the past as well, and I just translated that into books. So I was asked, have you got a book to go alongside it? Now, I had quite a big lead up to this event, and I thought I could actually write one. And I did write one, but I was at the beginning of my author journey then as well. So there was that. And I have changed phenomenally in the last five, six years. So the way I approach things 
is I'm still the same person I am, but the way I approach things is different. There's also been a lot of different um, changes in terms of when I first wrote my first book, people were using Amazon ads, they were using, they were using Facebook ads, but they weren't, and paid advertising wasn't quite so as important as it is now. It was part of a portfolio, but it has become increasingly more important as time goes on, as businesses, quite rightly, try to make money. Because we're using a lot of these platforms for free, and we were using them for free advertising, which was fabulous while it lasted, but no business can run on that model. Uh, They need to make money. So I don't blame them for going down that route. I might think, oh, it's a shame, but I understand it. And there are a lot of different platforms come and they go. So things that I was talking about in the first book don't even exist anymore. Books that I was talking, advising people to look at in the first book no longer are in print. And one, for example, which is about um, social media marketing by Chris Sines, that's actually now only available as an audio book. It's not available any other way. So a lot has changed. Audio books are more important. A lot of things, um, and COVID as well, has meant that ebooks are even more important. Bookshops are closing. Things like Bertram, I can't remember, I can never remember if it's Bertram's or Gardner's, but one of them is on the verge of collapse. So that's a book distributor. There have been a lot of changes in the last five, six years. So that was why I decided it was time to completely, I've, I've retired the old one completely and just brought it out as a new edition. I also wanted to brand it as the other thing. I've branded it in a new series along with my Motivation Matters books. So I wanted to change the branding because it needed a refresh. In fact, it needed to stick a dynamite under it, to be honest. <laughs> And it's so funny because I decided this year would be my Operation Evergreen was what I had, which is the books that are not evergreen need to be updated. So they are because there is a marketing mindset. There are evergreen principles of marketing. And what, as you say, what changes are the nuts and bolts and the kind of technical things which change every blooming five minutes. I find that nonfiction that is not uh, principle based or mindset based, it does need more regular updating, which makes it just more difficult, right, to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When it comes to the technical aspect, I, to be honest, I brought the book out last week. Something technically will have changed this week. You can't get around that. And one of the things I did do, because I've been editing during COVID and updating it as much as I can, but I didn't bring COVID into it because, quite frankly, two years down the road, if people are still using this, they're not going to be talking about COVID. But I have brought a lot of techniques in that people have been using. StreamYard has come out of nowhere for using for using Facebook Video. live events so you mm. can invite other people in. Since the first book, Facebook have changed the way you can do Facebook live and the way you can bring extra people in. You can do it from mobiles, but not computers. So things change. I could say all that this week and next week, Facebook or whoever will have changed everything back again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. We have to do the best we can and then get the book out and put a stake in the ground. My audio for authors, which came out early 2020, there's been a few things that have happened since then in the voice tech space. And that's just going to keep on changing. And right up until the last moment of the print formatting, I was like, oh, just this is going to keep changing. But you just have to bite the bullet. So I wanted to ask you, how are you approaching book marketing differently for fiction and nonfiction? What do you do differently between them? Up until this year, when all went pear-shaped, I did a lot of events for my fiction, but I also did different events for my non-fiction. So my non-fiction sells extremely well when I'm speaking at conferences and things. And when I say conferences, conferences for writers, yeah, or marketers, Mm. they sell extremely well. My fiction sells at book signings, but people will buy both. Somebody will come along to buy a non-fiction book and they'll buy everything. I've had somebody buy every single book I've ever written at a book signing just because they happen to be there. But we can't talk about books, uh, just book signings at the moment because they're not happening. So I've approached things differently um, in terms of I'm doing a lot of online things. I'm setting up a course to go alongside my nonfiction. So I've been listening to what you've been saying, Joanna, and I'm going to have multiple streams of income. And I can't remember the proper term for it, but it's using a book 
to a non-fiction book and having multiple branches out of it and having it in so many different ways. So I have been listening. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm doing a lot of different things like that. There have been a lot of opportunities to do online for both. And you're just marketing to different people. The marketing, the way you market is the same. Obviously, if you're marketing a children's book, you're going to market it. Like I say, oh, Bertie's Scotland's very own wee escape artist and he's a little bit of fun. You're not going to do the same for that as D.I. Shona McKenzie is in the middle of killing someone. No, not killing someone. She doesn't kill anybody. Solving another serial killer murder. So you have, they all need to be marketed differently. The way you market, the, the, the language you use when you're marketing them is different because you're wanting to resonate with different um, audiences. And I'm NLP trained, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. So I try to use language when I'm using it online. I try to use language that will resonate with different people. And so that's one way you can do it. I guess that I'm more specifically around, for example, I use uh, bookbub ads as one thing that I do. And but for nonfiction, Amazon ads are working really well for my nonfiction, but not so well for my fiction. And then maybe going on pod, my podcast sells my nonfiction. So are there specific things you like specific yes. things that you actually do for either of, of those Yes, absolutely. My non-fiction, I do Facebook ads and Amazon ads. And the Amazon ads seem to be working fairly well at the moment, as you say, which is a good thing. I haven't done it. I've never been successful in getting a BookBub yet. But I do use other platforms, the same as BookBub. So I use Fussy Librarian. For my fiction, I use Fussy Librarian. I use, I'm going to use BookCave, which is a new one. BookCave, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they use a, a, a... system like um like this cinema so they will literally read your book and then they will give you a a rating and they will tell the audience whether it's got violence or swearing or sex or if it's moderate minor a major focus so they literally sort your book out into the right audience which i think is a good thing it's just a different way of doing it but i use a lot e-reader news today i use them um i use i can't think of them off the top of my head but i do use a lot of those for my non for my fiction sorry and they work well because they literally go into the inbox of someone who likes that genre so you're targeting the right people And I wondered, because again, talking about the literary people, I met some very literary people when I came to your event in Scotland that time. And people who perhaps, as you mentioned, the sort of grants that Scottish writers can get, people who I thought were quite resistant to the idea of doing your own marketing in many ways. And I like, what do you, because I I feel that still authors are resisting this kind of marketing and you seem to be absolutely just completely at it and what attitude shift have you had to make or do you think authors need to make in order to be more effective at marketing first of all they need to get over the mindset that they can just sit and write writers think they're writers and they don't have to do anything else with all due respect whether you're traditionally published or independently published you're running a business. It's a business. If you're paying the tax man, you're running a business. Yeah, it's not a hobby. It's not something that you want to do and somebody else will do it all for you. It's not going to happen. I've had people say to me, oh, I want a traditional publisher because I can't be bothered marketing. I bite my tongue because I want to laugh, but I don't laugh because I'm quite a polite person to people. And I say, you do realize that most traditional publishers are not going to do any marketing for you unless your name is uh, associated with a billion dollar business already without mentioning names. <laughs> um, so it's, you've got to get over the mindset that you will not need to market. And for, writers seem to think that it's somehow ugly or to market and it's not quite the thing. Seriously, would you run any other business without telling people that you're there or spending money on advertising, or having an advertising budget, or a promotion. You wouldn't. No other business in the world runs like that. 
The music business doesn't run like that. If a band brings out a new a new album, whether they're an indie or whether they've got a record label, they're t- telling the world about it. And yet writers seem to think it's all going to happen just as if by magic. So you do need to change your mindset and you need to realize it's a business. The minute you are giving the tax man money and you're having to put a tax return in, you are running your own business and only you can do that. And why would anybody not market? Because whether, if you're traditionally published or you're independently published, you can control your marketing from A to Z within reason. You can't really if you're traditionally published because the ads have to be done by your publisher. You can't just set up an ad for something. Uh, the publisher has to be involved. But otherwise, you can let people know about your book. You can control it. So why wouldn't you want to control that? Why wouldn't you want to do more to get your book seen? Yeah, I think it's that people, I think people are scared. I think also in this environment now where it's pay to play, people are scared about potentially investing money. But as you say, it's a business and no business every business has to spend money on things like marketing and and advertising. In fact, I remember when I first set up my business uh, here in the UK and after moving back from Australia and my accountant was really surprised at how little I spent on advertising because as you say back then like a decade ago uh, we didn't have to spend the money (laughs) I was selling books and making money without actually spending money on advertising or very much money and she was like how are you how are you doing that (laughs) And, and now I'm like yeah she's oh yeah I see you spend more on advertising these days yeah unfortunately that is the way it has to be but I do think people are scared it's interesting that you have this other book so it's called Motivation Matters right Yes. Yes. Yeah. So t- tell us a bit more about that because you said it's in a series and so it must the mindset stuff must be related. Yeah, it's uh, Motivation Matters and Marketing Matters and it's now called the Writing Matters series. Basically, Motivation Matters is 366 exercises to get you writing every day. And it includes an extra day for a leap year because I didn't want the leap year to feel left out. <laughs> 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 but you don't have to follow it. From, a, from the first page to the last and do all the exercises in um, order. And some of the exercises you might not even want to do, but I encourage people to do them. And they're based on NLP, they're based on Neuro Linguistic Programming, and it's to get your brain thinking in a different way. And it, it's got a lot to do with lighter, writer's block, block that I don't actually believe in, but a lot of people are saying that they're stuck, they can't move forward, they can't get motivated. And I... I do different things to get myself motivated. So every exercise is designed to make your brain think in a different way. It's even down to, and I don't think this this example is in the book, but it's just if you get up in the morning and you usually brush your teeth with your right hand, if you brush it with your left hand, your brain will go nuts because it will go, what's happening? And it will waken up more quickly. Yeah. Mm. Because your brain is, your brain expects what it expects. And it's the old story. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And you're not going to change anything by doing the same thing all the time. (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. And sometimes you just need to jolt yourself out of what you, how you used to do things. The pandemic certainly done that (laughs) for many of us. (laughs) Although I think everybody, and I'm talking about big name authors here as well, Everybody, the first two or three weeks of the pandemic, they just their brain just went, "What on earth's happening here?" And nobody could write. No, you're right. I I struggled as well those first few weeks, and then went, "All right, it's uh, get on with things." But it definitely took a, a while to to settle in. Yeah, but as you say, I agree. You said earlier that people won't be talking about it in a couple of years. I totally agree with you. I think whatever the re- the reality is, it's part of what the the future so it's good not to put it in books that's the people are questioning or should we like with your your shona uh, detective books would you have something with the pandemic in it i I personally am not going to do that i think i'm just going to skip it entirely yeah i'm the same but to be honest i don't bring other things in like when there was the scottish referendum i didn't bring that into my books and that was big up here but Mm. I'd, so I wouldn't bring the, I'm not going to bring the pandemic in. What I, I found is that everybody's saying that they find it difficult to get their characters to shake hands or hug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any problem with that. Although my characters don't do that anyway. Yeah, they, they don't, don't go around. Either. 
No, I suppose if you're writing romance, that's more important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but in terms of what we do include in our books, I wanted to ask you about this because I know you're a committed Christian. And, yes. you know, what I think you're a wonderful person. And I think that the way you demonstrate your Christian faith is brilliant because you don't preach it. Like you're not a preachy person. You're just very accepting and lovely. And, there is there are many people of faith listening and I feel like sometimes people worry I don't potentially want to write Christian fiction as in put that in that category on the bookstores but I want to include my faith or my faith principles in my writing so how do you bring aspects of faith into your books or do you and how does that play a part in your literary life my dear Shauna McKenzie books I made a I made a decision when I was writing them. Okay, there's violence in them. It's serial killers. You're not have violence. So that's going to happen. But I made the decision that there was going to be no sex or no swearing in them. And that I don't swear. So it would be difficult for me to get people to swear. And I've made it into a bit of fun. I've done that. So D.I. Shona McKenzie always goes, hey, no swearing. But not all the time, because that would get boring. But I've made it into fun because the sergeant says to the criminals when they go to swear, no swearing. And they're like, why? Is I want you speaking like a ballerina because the DI doesn't like it. So I've done it that way. There's no sex because I couldn't write a sex scene if you paid me. <laughs> but as a result, the, the books are suitable for anybody to read. They can be read by Christians or non-Christians. Now, this is quite quite a thing if you're marketing a lot of the christians in the um states will not read books if they've got sex or swearing in them they just won't do it that's part of their culture and that's fine i have no problem with that but it just so happens that mine are like that now when it comes to my cast claymore investigate series which is humorous crime she's got a sister the reverend percy she's perso Persephone but she gets called the Reverend Percy and she's a Church of Scotland vicar but she's as funny as heck because it's a comedy book and she what I do is it just comes in naturally so there's no preaching I'm not trying to convert anybody to the Church of Scotland it's just a load of fun Cass will go up to her sister and say I need all your worthies. And she's going, what are you talking about? Your women's guild. I need them to help me put the feelers out. And her sister's, you can't use my women's guild as part of your detective agency. No, I need to. So it all comes in quite naturally. And there is faith in that, but it's not a force it down your throat type of faith because that doesn't work. I'm not, I was never felt that I was meant to be writing specifically Christian fiction. If I wanted to write Christian fiction, I would, but I don't think that's what I've, meant to be doing so I don't do it so it's just it's just having characters who are people of faith but not specifically pointing them out or having any kind of message no I don't have any message really if people want to see that vicars can be fun the thing is in in, um, a lot of fiction the Christians are often seen as or any other faith I'm not just saying Christians I'm saying people of faith are often seen as being the bad guy Make them funny, take the mick out of them, make them and just bring them in naturally. That's the way to do it because you're not, uh, books are not the place to be shoving your faith down people's throats. They want to enjoy it, not think that they're trying to be dragged into some sect somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I actually write more religious books than you do in that I, even though I'm not a a Christian, but it's so, I find this a very interesting line to walk because I have a lot of Christians who read my books because I base a lot on biblical history and and that type of thing. So I possibly have a larger Christian audience than you do. (laughs) (laughs) You probably do. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the swearing and the, the sex thing because I discovered that very quickly with my first book which was originally called Pentecost and is now Stone of Fire uh, and I actually did an edit I, I'm not a big sweary person but I think I did have a couple of words that were not favorable and I did have a it's very small it was not what you'd even call a sex scene but it was enough of one that I got people complaining about that even though I had all kinds of murders and death and <laughs> people alive but that was fine what was not fine was these specific things so I agree it's it's an interesting way to go obviously there are 
Christian writers who do include those things and that's not a problem either it's just what you yeah. prefer no that's fantastic so we are uh, out of time so I do, I do just have one last question what are you excited about going forward? You've got all these things going on. You've got lots of different books going on. You're involved in all these organizations. What are you excited about for the next couple of years for your own uh, writing career? I'm very excited about the, the books that are still going to be happening in the series. Seven books down, my seventh day, I Shona McKenzie is about to come out. And seven books down, people still like her. To be honest, I always thought eight books would be about the maximum for a series. But people keep saying, is there another one coming? Is there another one coming? So I'll keep writing them. Um, Cass Claymore, I, very silly. I started with the alphabet. So it's Antiques and Alibis. And the second one's Blood and Bones. Oh, no. It brings me to a 26 book series. I might not get through the whole. I might not get through the whole alphabet because I think people will get bored by the time I get to H. And I'm doing this narrative nonfiction book, which is exciting me as well, because it is a different project. And my I've got a very tentatively got a publisher who's interested in that because I, they want me to pitch it to them. Whether that will happen or not, I don't know. As I say, there will be more Bertie the Buffalo books coming out. And I'm going to be doing more international tours as well, which is nice. So give or take COVID, because I don't know what will happen next year. Will I still be able to go to America next year? I should be in America as we speak, but I'm not. I'm in Dundee, so... <laughs> Yes, so well, hopefully people can see you with Bertie the Buffalo uh, in 2021. That would be awesome. (laughs) Bertie loves it. He's even got his kilt ready for his trip to the States. Oh, brilliant. And I'm going to have to find a picture and put it in the show notes because it really is a gorgeous toy. Uh, So (laughs) where can people find you and your books online? You can find me anywhere. Books are good books are so all the usual suspects, Amazon, Kobo, Nook, Apple Books everywhere. You can get me through my website, which is really easy. It's wendyhjones.com. And for heaven's sakes, do not forget that H because there's another writer who doesn't have the H in her name. And our discussion of what goes in our books, she has that in her books and I don't. (laughs) So you'll get a shock. (laughs) So it's Wendy H. Jones for a reason. So wendyhjones.com. And I'm Wendy H. Jones on every social media known to man. So any social media, if you do Wendy H. Jones, you'll find me. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Wendy. That was great. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm such a fan girl. So to be on your show is, an, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I hope you found the interview with Wendy useful. I certainly think her attitude of trying different genres and following her creative interests is important for all of us who are multi-passionate creators. We are just in, incapable of focusing on one thing. I'm definitely one of those people. and uh, But we do need to all learn to balance saying yes to opportunity while saying no to the things that don't serve our long-term goals. So I definitely enjoyed talking to Wendy. So next week, I'm talking to Daniel Parsons about networking for authors, how to make friends, sell more books and grow a publishing network from scratch. We talk about online networking as well as in person because, of course, we do a lot online these days. And I never thought I'd say this, but I am really looking forward to doing some networking in person in 2021. I have been to quite a few online conferences, spoken at a few, and I am so over the Zoom. I don't know about you, but I will definitely, as soon as we can, I will be travelling to conferences. And I wonder if there is that pent-up demand amongst quite a lot of people (laughs) right now. So we also have tips for introverts and those of you who might also be shy, as well as why long-term thinking is so important. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.